<laughs> that introduction was like a glass of wine. It smells pretty, but it shouldn't be swallowed. <laughs> I changed my speech, because I don't believe in reading speeches. I got this from Irving Lee, but I did write a 50-page paper, and I hope the speech tonight will be more enjoyable, because I brought all my best jokes and illustrations to demonstrate non-verbally, factually, how Irving Lee lectured at Northwestern University, and how I did not nearly, nearly as good, believe me. First, I want to mention, because we are videotaping this and making this available, people will ask, what are some good books in general semantics? And I'm returning your kind words by mentioning this is the best new book introduction on general semantics. I teach on a sophomoric level, as you will see tonight. And others of you uh, teach on a more scientific, scholarly level. You will see a more scholarly level, perhaps, in the paper that I wrote already, 50-page paper on the history of uh, man's thought from pre-scientific thinking, the projections and animisms and other kinds of misevaluations of pre-scientific thinking of pre-scientific man to the Aristotelian era, Galileo, Newton, Einstein, post-Einsteinian thinking of quarks and string theory, in fact, I've added on to the structural differential, the electrons, protons, neutrons, submicroscopic level. Further up are the string theory and quarks. Also, I'm going to go into the original, or one of the predecessors of Korzybski, Niels Bohr, who was an original general semanticist. And this will be available to all of you, either through the general semantics bulletin, or we'll publish it as a separate uh, uh, paper, article, book, or whatever. And that was going to be a large book that I've been doing research on for 10 years. I've underlined 150 books. I don't read books, I underline them, mark in the margin, everything related to general semantics. And as far as I know, not too many people have uh, written books on the relationship between general semantics and the philosophy of science, and I do this, as I will point out in the paper, that there are many people who have been critical of general semantics. In fact, I didn't bring it with me, some of you might like to know, I did send to Jeff and to Paul Johnson a book I edited on some really fine articles on general semantics written by Hayakawa, written by um, what is Aristotelian Structure of Language, Rappaport, Stuart Chase, many others, I edited that book. Hopefully it will come out next year. I also edited another book on critics of general semantics. Irving Lee once said, you know, we've got to deal with the critics of general semantics, like Bruce did with Max Black and his book on, on logic. And I've got another book of quite a few critics of general semantics, because many of them are based upon total misunderstanding. And one uh, critic, he said, if you want to learn general semantics, you don't go to at science and sanity. And here, Korzybski quotes invented science and sanity, or general semantics in science and sanity. So that paper will be coming up. This is a fine introductory book. Also, uh, the, the International Society Say of the, the title, <laughs> What? Can you give the title? Say the title, please. What? Have the book. The book's title. Everybody knows all about it. <laughs> <laughs> Except the title. Drive yourself sane. Yes. That's only part of it. By Susan Presby Kodish and Bruce I. Kodish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the other book, uh, as you all know, we republished this. Still a classic, People in Quandaries. And uh, when Jeff had uh, the seminar, he asked the question, uh, something about how can we train in general semantics? Do I have any ideas? I made a comment, and uh, the, one of the valuable things for me being here, I did uh, add on to uh, Wendell Johnson's People in Quandaries, if you look in the back of the book, semantic exercises, 
and I did uh, add uh, at least five more of things that teachers can do to help extensionalize your understanding of general semantics, so you get off of the verbal level. Also, I brought here an outline of the book that I wrote 40 years ago. I've got one chapter to finish. <laughs> and I got involved in my nightclub career in San Diego, literally working day and night for 40 years. Uh, I apologize if I talk about myself, but as Bois said, Sam Bois in an introduction in his book, either The Art of Awareness or the other one, Explorations in Awareness, he said, who else's nervous system can I talk about? <laughs> because I need to talk about drawing people. Why don't we have more people in general semantics? And one of the reasons I became a nightclub hypnotist is everybody in the world, they want to be entertained. They don't want to be educated. When I had my success motivation seminars and I changed from general semantics to uh, an effective communication to success motivation, because I found out that more people would, like, would rather learn how to become a millionaire than learn how to lessen misunderstandings. And so while I started off with 300 students and went down to 200 and 100 and when we had the gas difficulties with gas in 1974, we had 50 students and then it went up. But I taught for 15 years with two, 300 people sleeping all over the place. You see, my seminars are under hypnosis and self-hypnosis. And I became a nightclub hypnotist because I dislike ignorance and stupidity of all kinds. Many years ago, I took a course in parapsychology at the University of Minnesota from Dr. William Heron, and he put on a demonstration of hypnosis. And I said to myself, what is this academic professor doing this carnival stuff for? People still have that kind of evaluation toward that taboo word, hypnosis. And so my minor in anthropology and my PhD, I wrote several papers on primitive mentality as well as taboos. And I believe, and I tried not to rationalize because I just happened to have made a lot more money as a nightclub hypnotist than I would as a teacher in one-fifth the time. But the big money, of course, is buying real estate. And a lady from Wisconsin said, I hear you're in real estate. And I said, no, I only buy it. <laughs> There's a big difference. And uh, this is why I've got to, I do give money for this. I'm also going to give money, I want to train people to lecture, or have you train them rather, lecture like Bob did to, the other day. As soon as he got out of the, uh, out of the gate, and I bet no one ever equated you with a racehorse. As soon as Bob got out of the gate, I knew he was a professional lecturer because he did everything that the professional one does. So today I want to talk very quickly about a course, and I've lectured on effective communication and general semantics to companies all over the country, especially when I was in Chicago. Someone once said that the trouble with Adam and Eve was not a red apple, but a green pear. <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about stupidity and ignorance and lack of knowledge. Because people have still not been taught the important principles of general semantics. And those of us who have written books on general semantics still have not abstracted one-tenth of what Krzyzewski wrote about. Irving Lee said, there's a gold mine of information here. And I try to present it on the easy-to-understand abstract level. Well, what do we mean by that? Many of you are familiar with Bill Haney's inference prone test. This was his PhD dissertation. And at the same time, I had a test, and we don't have time to give you, you know what I'm talking about. I made a test for X number of different principles. Projection and misunderstanding, for example, I opened up my class, and I don't give them a lecture on general semantics at all. Which girl do you think is more beautiful? Number one, A, Diane Darling, or B, Elsie Zadrowski? <laughs> Number two, A, Bessie Hatcraft, or B, Louise Love? Three, A, Lisa Hoy, or B, Joy Lamar? <laughs> Number four, Lorette LaRue, or B, Fedora Artbark? 
<laughs> Number five, Letitia He, B, A, and Star. Which fellow do you think is more handsome? Number one, A, Tim Condon, or B, A, Schwartz? <laughs> Number two, Alan Dale, Dill, or B, Nick Nicopopoulos? <laughs> and I go up and down, and would you believe they answer it before I lecture on anything in general semantics? Now, we did videotape my lectures at San Diego State, and uh, the next day that I come in, I lecture in class, and I read the same quiz. And you think they answer it? No, they're laughing like heck. Because they've changed, they realize it's stupid to answer this kind of a question. We don't know from the words alone. So I have many different quizzes that I give my students that I want to share with Steve and others. Uh, one on projection and misunderstanding, one on the two value and orientation, uh, many, many others. As I told Bill, Amy, he called it an EQ test, an evaluation quotient. And I said, no, that's, you've got to index it. Your test is only for fact inference principle, EQ1. Then you construct, and I hope some of you will take me up on this, to construct your own kind of a quiz before you give your students a lecture on general semantics. Because Korzybski has said, and we know philosophy professors would say of general semantics, uh, that's old stuff. And they're the ones who violate the principles the most. Some are the ones who have this kind of a all this orientation. So you've got to construct a quiz to invite them to misunderstand, invite them to jump to conclusions, invite them to behave stupidly. And I always say this because I was teaching 50 top executives for about 13 years at the University of Chicago's Management Development Seminar. And they love this kind of training. I give them the quiz before any lectures, and then I give them the quiz at the end. At the end, uh, one guy got about 56 wrong out of 70 or so. <laughs> uh, at the beginning, before I had any lectures whatsoever. And then at the end of the course, he came up with his test. They only had about four or five wrong. And he came up, and he's almost mad at me. He said, you mean to say I was this goddamn dumb? <laughs> I almost said yes. <laughs> they also say, why didn't I get this stuff 30 years ago? You've heard it all of you. Yeah. Why aren't my kids getting this today? And I'm talking about a certain way of teaching. I'm talking about getting it into their nervous system. I'm talking about it becoming enjoyable. I don't stand in one place like the unfortunate thing with Irving Lee and the tests that he gave and the videotapes he made. Dr. Lee and I were driving downtown Chicago. He said, you know, they want me to make some films for Indiana University. I don't know if I should because he was very busy. And I said, yes, you know, this is very time binding to make those films. And we're all very fortunate that he did. But while we have the films of Irving Lee lecturing to a camera, you don't have Irving Lee tape to tape with students. This is when he was at his best. You know, no games and quizzes and invite them to participate. And this is how you teach general semantics. Not one way communication. And so Lee would go to the blackboard. And I'll get to the principle of misunderstanding and he'll say, give me a directive that I cannot possibly misunderstand. One person will raise his hand, well, write your name on the board, okay? Your name on the board. Or he'll write it with his finger. <laughs> it's the easiest thing in the world to misunderstand. The only time I'm Cutting this short because I've got a lot of different principles and things to cover. My students only got me one time. I was teaching at the University of Chicago's Management Development Seminar. I lecture from 4.30 to 6, and then we take a coffee or dinner break and from 6 to 7, come back at 7 to 8.30. And I said, you've got one hour during dinner. See if you can think of a, a directive that I cannot misunderstand. One guy was standing or sitting down in the corner there. He stood up, and I said, okay, what is the directive? He had an eraser in his hand. He threw it at my head and said, duck. <laughs> <laughs> I 
did not misunderstand. <laughs> so we, and I'm trying to get those of you, we all have different personalities, but you've got to be more dynamic and meaningful and practical and pragmatic if you want to get it to the introductory student. I'm not that bright. I, I like to teach on the introductory level, even for top executives in industry. We had many professors at the University of Chicago who couldn't teach these executives. They were too theoretical. They were way up here. They want to know how do you admit less than misunderstandings? How do you stop jumping to conclusions? How do you stop individuals from thinking that if they know it all? I had one executive from the Omaha Gas Company who used to come in from Omaha to Chicago, took the seminar, said, you know, we have trouble with uh, some of our individuals. The psychological tests say they have poor judgment. We don't know what that means. So I said, well, during the course, I'll give you much more of an example in terms of poor judgment. So I explained a little bit. Poor judgment, judgment is defined by, number one, having signal and symbol reactions. Number two, jumping to conclusions. Number three, having an ominous orientation, not looking for enough facts. And the whole course, which I gave to them, and here is an outline that I have here for those of you who like it. My entire course, Dr. Lee's entire introductory course called Language and, Act, Language and Thought. The intentional orientation on one side, the extensional orientation on the other. The extensional orientation being the scientific method, the intentional method, of course, is the verbal orientation. I define it a little differently in the speech that I wrote. You see, the intentional method, Irving Lee said, how do you solve problems? There are two different ways. The intentional way, through logic, through reasoning, through debate, argumentation. That goes back to Aristotle and Plato. The extensional way of solving problems is the scientific method of experimentation. So those two principles are the two main ones that I looked for in the whole history of science. The extensional and the intentional orientation and elementalism and non-elementalism. And where you have scientific progress, you had non-elementalism come into play. They used to assume that electricity and magnetism were separate. Now we have electromagnetism. And there are many, many other ex examples that I abstracted. I also have here, some of you who took this seminar, a speech for all occasions. You can give it anywhere. These are high order abstractions that are not specific and concrete. I brought enough for everyone. What do we mean specific and concrete? Very simple to explain. Here, we have Milton's chair. The word chair stands for this nonverbal object. And then we have the word chair stands not only for this chair, but all chairs. And then we have the word furniture, which includes this chair and other kinds of furniture. See, higher order abstractions. And then we have business, industry, commerce. You see the different orders of abstraction. And the important thing is to teach people how to be specific and concrete. Because as I will point out very quickly, this is where you have misunderstandings in the levels of high order abstractions. And it's ignorance. We're all ignorant in many areas. But stupidity is something else again. If you don't understand someone else, ask them what do you mean. As we will see, the burden for effective communication is upon who? The speaker or the listener? Both. Oh, I spend time. The speakers assume I gave you, I handed you a handful of meaning as you have me had water in the glass. I'm assuming it's water. <laughs> Not in Bob Pilmer's glass. Hi, <laughs> hi. <laughs> so I can hand you meaning, say something to you, and if your afflictor quotes all this, and as I'll get into, the most important thing about the allness orientation is that it is, is strong, extremely subtle. 
Those of you teaching general semantics, emphasize that word. It does not necessarily manifest itself in the extreme form of dogmatic behavior, the know-it-all, the closed mind. It manifests itself in extremely subtle ways. The refusal to listen, the refusal to learn. Oh boy, I used to teach at Northwestern's Traffic Institute. I love teaching these army officers, police chiefs, <coughs> Navy officers. When they came to class with their uniform on, they'd shove a shoulder at you and say, okay boy, I dare you to teach me. <laughs> Show me something I don't already know. They come to class in a t-shirt and their behavior was different. Mm -hmm. And I had one colonel, this is interesting, he sent me a letter. He says, I want you to know during the class, I didn't believe one damn word you said. He said, I now find myself practicing these principles. Would you please send me your quiz? I want to teach this way. So what I do, the first principle that I want to talk about very quickly is the signal reaction. I don't have time to put everything. Here we have a happening that the Kodish has covered, happening which has number two, nervous impact. Number three, there's an evaluation, a way of thinking. Number four, talk. And uh, Susan and Bruce, I emphasize the word, you emphasize talking, etc. Add, and I'm sure I know you do, add the word act. Because we're concerned about behavior that is not scientific. In fact, Irving Lee called his introductory class language and thought. And I says, why don't you call it language, thought, and behavior? And he says, the psychology boys think that behavior is within their province. <laughs> well, when I wrote the book, and I'm going to finish it, how to think, communicate, and behave, that's an inference, how to think, communicate, and behave intelligently, and behave intelligently, we are concerned with behavior. George Sandiana said, the aim of education is the condition of suspended judgment on everything. I don't know. Let's see, how can we train people in saying, I don't know? I could go into anthropology, which was my minor. I have made many examples here. So this is the first barrier to effective communication, the, the signal reaction. Irving Lee had that principle at the end of his course. And I says, I put it at the beginning of mine, because it's a signal reaction that leads into all the kinds of misevaluations, jumping to conclusions, thinking that you know it all. They work together, of course, but I put it uh, at the beginning. The second principle that I teach, and I'm not going to give all the differentiating characteristics, is jumping to conclusions. They're in my little booklets. I've given them some, some of you. The difference between a statement of fact and an inference. For example, my mother rented a room in her house for two boys whom she did not know. She was a little worried at first, but in a few days she stopped fretting. They must be nice boys, she explained. They have towels from the YMCA. <laughs> Well, I ask my students, make a statement of fact about this. And they will say, they're thieves, they're no good, etc., etc. It's the easiest thing in the world to jump to conclusions. It takes no gray matter at all. A well filled bus was uh, pacing down a, proceeding down a Boston thoroughfare when a truck cut sharply into its path and only the bus driver's quick wits and action prevented disaster. Pale and shaken, he voiced his estimate of the vanishing truck driver's character, origin and mode of life, in words of Paul and Lee Stark. Then remembering the audience at his back, he turned to face them. A little white-haired woman forestalled his apology. My congratulations, she said, upon an admirable presentation of what we may reasonably assume to be the facts. <laughs> the one that I like is this, it's kind of subtle, very subtle, and it afflicts all of us. A man accompanied by a small boy entered the barber shop and he asked for a haircut. When the barber had finished with him, the man said, I'm going next door for a beer. 
Well, he cut the kid's hair. The barber gave the boy a haircut and waited for the man to return. Finally, he turned to the kid and asked, where in Pete's sake did your father go to? Oh, said the boy, that ain't my father. He's a man who stopped me in the street and asked me if I'd like to get a free haircut. <laughs> The third barrier to effective communication is the Amish orientation. And the Cornishes, plus many people, give an excellent description of the process of abstracting. Our nervous system abstracts. And if we take at least an hour and go around the room, why can't we know? I at first asked the question, can we know all about anything? And finally, they come to the conclusion, after a while, you cannot know all about anything. Then I asked them, have you ever met individuals who act as if they know all about everything or something? Oh, yeah. So I was the other person. So the obvious orientation, the other half of abstracting, is that if you are not conscious of abstracting, you fall victim to the obvious orientation. And the important thing is it's so extremely subtle. It manifests itself, and usually I go along with some of the illustrations, the refusal to listen. All of you are listening to a different lecture right now. All of you are sitting on your assumptions, and I'm standing on mine. How do we know that the roof won't cave in? Life is a series of assumptions, but wisdom begins when we check our assumptions, when we don't pass off our inference and assumptions as if. They were factual. So the honest orientation manifests itself in the refusal to listen, the refusal to learn, the refusal to look or look again, the refusal to change or keep up to date, assuming knowledge that one doesn't have, the refusal to ask questions, both the speaker and the listener must ask the other person, do you know what I mean, etc. So we have many examples here. Here's one that I like of abstracting. We were sitting in the lobby of the hotel and she walked swiftly by us. She turned a corner and sharply was gone. That's an uncommonly good looking girl, I said to my wife, who was deep in the crossword puzzle. You mean the one in that imitation blue taffeta dress with the green and red flower design? <laughs> the girl that just walked by, I said. Yes, said my wife, with that dowdy rayon dress on. The copy of the one I saw at Patty Carnegie's, and a poor copy of that. You'd think, though, that she'd have better taste in the word a chartreuse hat with it, especially with her bleached hair. <laughs> bleached? I didn't know if her hair was bleached. Good heavens, you could almost smell the peroxide. <laughs> I don't mind a bit of makeup, provided it looks fairly natural, but you could screw it, scrape that rouge off with a knife. They add a, course, uh, add a course in makeup to the curriculum at Smith. Smith, why Smith? From her class pin, of course. You must have noticed it hanging from her charm bracelet. I wasn't looking at her wrist. I bet you weren't, nor at those fat legs of hers either. A woman with legs like that shouldn't wear high heeled patent leather shoes. Well, you may be right, said my wife. I was busy with my puzzle and I didn't notice her particularly. <laughs> and you know what an atheist is, don't you? An atheist is the person who goes to a Notre Dame Southern Miss football game and doesn't care who wins. <laughs> Here's a good general semantics principle. And for many, many years, you know, I watch, I watch a lot of sports. I happen to have four television sets that I watch every night at the same time including my favorite 61-inch one where I watch sports right now. I'm videotaping the fight. I hypnotized Ken Norton for two and a half years. Bob was at the fight where he was knocked out by Jose Garcia, 1970. I was having my success seminars at Ken Norton's manager's hotel in La Jolla, all the in. I saw this gray-haired guy back there being hypnotized. And he came up to me and says, you know, my boxer Ken Norton just got knocked out by Jose Garcia. I believe in what you're teaching, success, motivation, and uh, would you hypnotize him? He did not listen to any fudge. I hypnotized Ken for two and a half years, right through when he broke Muhammad Ali's jaw. Then I was supposed to be on Johnny Carson's show with Ken, 
but the manager went on Johnny Carson's show with Ken North himself. They froze me out completely, and I wouldn't hypnotize them after that. And uh, then they said that I was uh, just a phony publicity gimmick to promote the first fight. I sued him for libel and slander, and I was awarded $50,000. Now, basically, what I'm saying is I teach in success motivation. Nobody cares, you, cares about you except you yourself. You've got to learn to be interdirected, to quote David Reisman in his book, The Lonely Crowd. And there are known laws of success. Steve, tomorrow if I could have five minutes, I've got many other cassettes that I've written and recorded. Charles Pierce's Philosophy of Science, uh, A.J. Ayer's book. Uh, I've got my whole success seminar, 13 cassettes, where I brought together general semantics, communication, and the laws of success. Now, heretofore, we didn't want to bring success motivation into general semantics. That's why we don't have too many people here. You've got to get to the average person. They're the ones who need it. And I can talk to you more about that. OK? Here's the one I like on abstracting. Some of you may recall this. In a railroad compartment, an American grandmother with her young and attractive granddaughter, a Romanian officer and a Nazi officer were the only occupants. The train was passing through a dark tunnel, and all that was heard was a loud kiss and a vigorous slap. After the train emerged from the tunnel, nobody spoke, but the grandmother was saying to herself, what a fine girl I have raised. She will take care of herself. I'm proud of her. The granddaughter was saying to herself, well, grandmother is a little uh, old enough to not to mind a little kiss. Besides, the fellows are nice. I'm surprised what a hard wallop grandmother has. <laughs> the Nazi officer was meditating, how, uh, what a clever fellow I am. They how clever those Romanians are, they steal a kiss and have the other fellow slapped. <laughs> the Romanian officer was chuckling to himself, how smart I am, I kissed my own hand and slapped the Nazi. <laughs> I like this next, next example because it's so subtle to all this orientation. Notice this, a friend of mine who's a father of 12 volunteered to babysit one evening so his wife could have an evening's relaxation at the movies. Don't let a single one of them come downstairs, his wife instructed him as she went out. He promised to carry out orders to the letter and just settled back uh, down to a book when he heard steps up the stairway. Get back upstairs and stay there, he commanded sternly. He read in peace for a few minutes, then again heard soft footsteps. This time he uh, added the threat of a spanking. Soon he again detected stealthy sounds and dashed out in time to see a small lad disappear at the top steps. He had hardly returned to his book when a neighbor came in distractedly. Oh, Fred, she wailed, I can't find my Willie anywhere. Have you seen him? Here I am, Ma, said a tearful voice from the top of the stairs. He won't let me go home. <laughs> now this all disorientation is so extremely subtle. And if we are trained in general semantics, we shouldn't behave like, quotes, the average person. Thomas Edison said, show me a thoroughly satisfied man, and I will show you a failure. Charles Kettering said, some minds are like concrete, all mixed up and permanently set. <laughs> and this again to show you the subtlety of this, here's another example. The young man said in a faint voice, you don't want to buy any life insurance, do you? I certainly do not, the sales manager replied. I thought you didn't, the embarrassed solicitor said, and he headed for the door. Then the sales manager called him back and addressed the confused and frightened young man. My job is to hire and train salesmen, and you're about the worst salesman I've ever seen. You'll never sell by asking people if they don't want to buy. But because you're apparently just starting out, I'm going to take out $10,000 worth of insurance with you right now. Get out an application blank. Fumblingly, the salesman did so, and the deal was closed. Then the sales manager said, another word of advice, young man, learn a few standard organized sales thoughts. Oh, I've already done that, the salesman replied. I've got a standard type for every type of prospect. This is my organized approach to sales managers. <laughs> 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 
And one final example deals with projection and misunderstanding. I ask my students, where do you find meaning? And invariably they will say, meanings are in words. When I was at Teachers College Columbia, I had a discussion with one of the English teachers, and she said, what's the difference if you say meanings are in words or meanings are in people? I didn't have the answer then. Well, I learned it later on from Irving Lee. Here we have the speaker. Here we have the listener. The speaker speaks with his meaning, and the listener listens with his or her meaning. This is mode A, and this is mode B. And the question is, how can we get the speaker and the listener on the same channel of communication? Mode C. I ask them, the burden for effective communication is upon who? The speaker or the listener? Some people say the speaker, some people say the listener. Obviously, it's upon both. If your concentration is on the speaker's words, if you start with the assumption that words meaning, words contain meaning, then you fall victim to the problem of misunderstanding. Irving Lee called it the container myth, the mythical assumption that words contain meaning as that glass contains water. As Charles Sanders Pierce said, and I call it Pierce in my recordings, because Pierce was the pronunciation when he was in England. And I've always called it Pierce even when I ran into the correct from, correct from the British point of view. Charles Sanders Pierce said, you do not get meaning, you respond with meaning. And so there are two ways of evaluating. Mode A, let's say mode A. If you assume that meanings are in words, you'll stop or short circuit the process of communication too quickly. The logic runs, I know what the word means, therefore I know what you mean. You stop right here and you misunderstand. But mode B, if you are trained in general semantics, to realize that meanings are not in words, they're in people. Your attention will be on the speaker. I don't want to know what the word means. I can look up 50 definitions in a dictionary. And it might very well be the wrong one compared to how you are using it. I want to know what you mean. And so it's the burden for effective communication is both upon the speaker to be specific and concrete. An extension is possible. It is also the burden upon the listener to get on the speaker's channel of communication. In business and industry, Charles, before an executive or a worker goes off and misunderstands the directive and costs the company hundreds of thousands of dollars, one simple question, what do you mean? How are you using the word? What do you want me to do? And this stuff is so simple, but so important in business and industry. In other words, words are ambiguous. We must be trained in the ambiguity of language. Number two, and I will cover these very quickly, we learn the meaning quotes, meanings of words from our past experience. Therefore, number three, Meanings are personal. All of you are listening to a different lecture. Number four, meanings are arbitrary. There's no inherent relationship between the word and what it represents. And number five, words don't mean anything. People mean. Meanings are in people. They are not in words. Well, I have, and we've talked about the test that we can give. I used to give my students, uh, here's one, the Illinois Institute of Technology, an ambiguous picture about a couple of guys, and there's a girl looking disheveled, and the question, what will they talk about? Who are these people? How will it come out? And on the bottom, name, age, and sex. Write that down. And a picture, it's hard to see, of a worker coming into his boss's office, very ambiguous. And so you send six people or five people outside, 
And one person, you let them look at a picture for a couple of minutes, then you bring the person in, he describes it to that person, then that bring another person in, they describe it to another person, and at the Illinois Institute of Technology, it ended up very, very small picture, guy and a girl were having sex in an alley. It was the funniest thing in the world as you saw the progression. And so in communication, you see two things happening. You have the loss of information, and you also will have adding in what was not there in the first place. Another test you can give your students that I give my students a lot. Bet you a drink you can't read this aloud correctly. And if you see this, Paris in the spring, slow men at work, once in a lifetime, bird in the hand. And I've gone all the way around the class, every one of them read the same thing, when in reality, it says burden the the hand. Slow men at, at work. Once in a, a lifetime. Burden the the hand. All the way around the room. People normally, naturally project their own meanings or what they expect to see. And so in human communication, number one, as we have said, you learn the meanings of words not from a dictionary, but from your past experience. The Lord's Prayer has had to withstand considerable abuse, especially from children trying to learn it from poor enunciators or from mumbling congregations. <coughs> One little boy was her, her, uh, heard to pray, Herald be thy name. <laughs> Another beg, give us this day our jelly bread. <laughs> A New York child petition, lead us not into Penn Station. <laughs> The wife was talking to the maid, you know, I suspect my husband is having an affair with his secretary. To which the maid replied, I don't believe it, you're only saying it to make me jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I like this one here, that was the subtlety of the eldest orientation. It was lunchtime, the elderly clerk opened his sandwiches, looked at them, exclaimed bitterly, cheese sandwiches, always cheese sandwiches. Why don't you ask your wife to fix you another kind of sandwich? A colleague asked. Who's married? Said the man indignantly. I make these sandwiches myself. <laughs> Sandy gets a lot of these emails. And I, like, I love this one. I break up laughing. I hope I won't be crying in front of all of you. <laughs> Let me share this with you. A lawyer questioning a, a doctor on the stand, the lawyer, first a question from the lawyer. Doctor, before you performed the autopsy, did you check the pulse? Answer, no. Question, did you check the blood pressure? Answer, no. Did you check for breathing? Answer, no. Question, so that it is possible that the patient was alive when you began the autopsy? Answer, no. Question, how can you be so sure, doctor? Answer, <laughs> because his brain was sitting on my desk in a jar. <laughs> Question, what could the patient have still been alive nevertheless? Answer, yes, it is possible that he could have been alive and practicing law somewhere. <laughs> All your responses, question, all your responses must be oral, okay? Answer, okay. What school did you go to? Answer, oral. <laughs> question, did you blow your horn or anything? Answer, after the accident? Question, before the accident? Answer, sure. I played for 10 years, I even went to school for it. <laughs> Judge, well, sir, I have renewed, reviewed this case, and I've decided to give your wife $775 a week. Husband, that's fair, Your Honor. I'll try to send her a few bucks myself. <laughs> Question, when is your birth? Answer, July 15th. 
Question, what year? Answer, every year. <laughs> it was announced today that Canada is now prepared to help the United States in its war against terrorism. They have promised to commit two of their, large, their largest battleships, 6,000 armed troops, and 50 fighter jets. However, after the exchange rate that comes down to a canoe, <laughs> two bounties, and a flying squirrel. <laughs> So, Ms. Hahn said, the judge, you want me to grant you a divorce on what grounds? Two acres, she said. <laughs> the judge frowned, I mean, do you have a grudge? Yes, sir, she answered, fits two cards. <laughs> Matter what I mean is, does he beat you up? Never. I got up half an hour before him to do aer aerobics. <laughs> Shaking his head, the judge said, I just can't understand why you want a divorce. Because, the woman replied, we just can't communicate. <laughs> well, we have a lot of these kinds of examples and illustrations to illustrate the humorous aspect of why we have misunderstandings, the ambiguity of language, and if you use jokes and illustrations and entertainment in your lectures. I once lectured at, um, oh boy, the big, big hotel in New York. Waldorf. Yeah, the Waldorf Historic for a management group. And I followed, I don't know if any of you ever heard of Elliot Janeway. He was a famous economist. The boorest, driest guy you ever met in your life. <laughs> And he was standing behind, reading his speech. Guys were going to sleep, talked a long time. See, I'm a speech teacher. I'm trying to, the speech, the speech teachers I had, believe me, I've had some of them speech conventions. Today, I want to lecture with public speaking students who are very bad speakers. They have no audience contact. They have no vocal projection. They have no vocal variety. These are speech teachers. So what I'm saying here, use examples and illustrations and jokes and above all bodily movements. You make a tough target. <laughs> well, one of the important things we learn that as we go through life, we know some of these principles, but it's still very difficult to get them into our nervous system. I've given some things to answer Jeff's question. How do you train people in general semantics? I've written a couple of pages on that. Number one, Wendell Johnson talked about the semantic diary. I've had my students use that at the uh, universities. I've written some other things of what you do. Cut out a fruit from a page. Cut out uh, any kind of food. And give it to your students. Uh, page from the paper or book and tell them to eat it. That's pretty essential. The word is not the thing. You've got to get out to the verbal level. And so although we realize that we should change our ways of thinking, communicating and behaving, it's still very difficult for many of us to do so as indicated by this final example. There was once a man who went around saying, you know, I think I'm dead. Oh His friends finally persuaded him to consult a psychiatrist. <laughs> when the patient told the psychiatrist that he thought he was dead, the psychiatrist told him to clench his fist and stand before a mirror and say, dead men don't bleed. <laughs> he told the man to repeat this motion six times a day for a month, each time saying, Dead men don't bleed. He told the man to go home and carry out his instructions and return at the end of the month. The patient carried out the instructions and at the end of the month he returned. The psychiatrist told him once again to go through the motions. The reason he had him tighten his fists was so the veins would come to the surface of the man's wrists. 
the man tightened his fists, and just as he said, dead men don't bleed, the psychiatrist jabbed the scalpel into the man's wrist. The blood gushed out, and the man hollered, by God, dead men do bleed. <laughs> Let me leave you with one bit of advice. Sounds I like mean this very, very practice. sincerely. Ah. Don't believe one word I've said. Go out and try it. Thank you all very much.